once you've got the plot for a book like this sorted out in your head, what is the actual writing process like? Do you do a lot of flow charting for these various strands? Do you do you, do you work with a software like Scrivener or something which which allows you to look at different plots simultaneously? What is the process like? Well, with me, it's uh, you know I'm a slow writer. I take a lot of time, so I don't do with the software. Um, uh, because I, I think in my mind, I could be incorrect, I think it has a formulaic feel therefore which can come from it. Mm -hmm. uh, my books are usually very character driven. So uh, with this one, I already had some of the characters in play. Then of course Harry came and W. Shra. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I typically try and do is sort of work my way through the plot. It's not that I have a beginning, middle and end very clear, which takes me a fair bit of time, you know, sort of just working through it. It's a very rough draft. And then I do something which I picked up from a blogger and a writer uh, who works in Hollywood and she loves this, uh, runs this absolutely lovely blog. Uh, where she said something which seemed to make sense, which is that, uh, so as Jay mentioned, there's various strands. There's the Meronissa strand, there is the Jag Mishra Raw strand, there is of course the, the, the Taliban strand, and then there is... Uh, the RP saying... Yeah, so the, the, you know, there's several strands. So what I do is, once I've sort of broadly got it, I write down on a notepad, uh, on post-its, then all the briefly Merlis are seen, so let's say there are 20 of them, or more, and then the uh, raw scene, the Taliban scene, and then I basically just, the way I've written it, I put the stick then. So Merlis are all pink stickers, let's say, and RP thing is yellow and everything. And then it sort of gives me a sense, oh my god, the story is very heavily in one and it's not moving. That's when I start doing the matrix, you know, sort of just shifting the scenes, because as you said, it's very important that all the narratives at any point are you know, sort of interlacing. You can't say, oh, this guy we left him 30 pages back, where does he come from? Yeah, you, you, you can't have a situation where you have the three or four consecutive chapters of only Melon this guy. Right. You have to cross part of it. So that's when all that process happens. And uh, I, I really don't know how I make my way through it, but I sort of do it and then juggle the scenes around. And it, it's also because here is a timeline, there's an ad for 96 hours. Yeah. So if this guy was doing this here, could he have been doing it 10 hours back? Right. You know, it's a, so it's a bit of, but it's good fun. Yes. I guess I'm, I, I like the more, the, the feely thing of it, you know, when yeah. you can sort of see it over there. And, and my daughter has great fun. Once in a while she'll come and she'll just switch those things around. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would be like, what, I just fixed this yesterday, what happened? But she's smart enough, she'll put the number behind, but something to, but she's done that. Manri, yeah. there are some authors you admire, you read them, you go back to them. Now, how do you stop their influence from coming into your writing? <coughs> Is that a conscious decision or uh, it doesn't come in at all in your writing? I think it does come in very strongly initially. Like when I started writing, uh, you know, I didn't go to a writing school. Nobody taught me writing. I taught, you know, myself how to write. Uh, so initially when, at least with me, uh, when I started writing, you know, the, you feel the voice is not yours. You know, you feel very good that you've got this output, that you managed to fill three pages, oh my God. But when you read it, you know it's, it's not, you know, it sounds like somebody else. But I think it's only by writing daily, uh, by engaging with that piece of paper and, you know, bringing your own thought process to it, that at some point you start to find your own voice. And then I don't think, you know, the influence really uh, comes in. But I think by the time you've written probably one book, hopefully you found your voice. Or you've written consistently for a period of time. Uh, you do find your voice. And for me, interestingly, it happened when, uh, you know, you hear these things, that the character, the, I don't know where this character came from. And this happened with me. It's like there's this character, and the character is leading the narrative in a certain way. And you're like, oh my god, how did this come about? And that's, the I think, the ultimate joy of being a writer, because you feel uh, that, oh my god, Am I writing this or is it coming from somewhere? And here, let me just quote Ghalib once because Ghalib actually says something very beautiful and I'm sure you, all of you will get it because you know, you're in Delhi. He says, Aate hai gab se dami khayal mein. You know, from somewhere in the heavens, this thought comes to me. Aate hai gab se, you know, dami khayal mein. Ghalib sarire khama nawai sarosh hai. You know, when Ghalib writes, the sound of his pen on paper is like the angel's whisper. So when I first heard it, you know, typically Ghalib is assumed, it's taken to be a very arrogant person. Your first assumption is, oh, Ghalib is saying I'm like the boy of the world, you know. But after a while, when you're a writer and you struggle with your writing, you realize what he's saying is that, I feel this is not me. He's become a medium. Right, you become a medium, because this is coming from somewhere, you're just channeling it. And I think that's the ultimate joy of 
No, um, see when I'm plotting, I use a lot of pen and paper, and actually not even pen, pencil and paper. I don't know. I think it's just some connect. You know, you sort of connect to your very early ways of writing, learning to write. So a lot of doodling, and I typically have a register for each book. So you know, a lot of that happens. But then the writing is on.